good day, everyone. My name is Marie Muldowney, and I'm the Managing Director at CSI, a Moody's Analytics company. I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar, A Career in Banking, Your Road Trip, Your Road Map to Success. If you're interested in a career in financial services, that includes banking, this webinar will provide insight into how to navigate your way to a role most successfully. So CSI is here to help you if you're on the job market for employment in the financial services industry. But let me first begin by a land acknowledgement. Canada is situated on the traditional territories of many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, places that have long served as sites of meeting and exchange. We recognize and respect the traditional custodians of the lands on which and the waters around which we meet today. So before we begin, just a few items. Today's webinar is being recorded. Any ratings, financial reporting analysis, projections, or other observations constituting any part of the information conveyed here are and must be construed solely as statements of opinion and not statements of fact or recommendations to purchase, sell, or hold any securities. We ask that no one record this webinar without Moody's written permission. And lastly, no one has permission to quote any of the questions or any of the comments made by the panelists or the webinar audience. Additionally, the views and opinions expressed or referred to by the speakers are solely those of the speakers and not the views, opinions, policies, or positions of the Canadian Securities Institute or Moody's or of the employees uh, of the employers of the speakers. All members of the audience are currently on mute. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box and we'll try and get to as many questions as we can. The Q&A box is found on the lower right hand side of your screen. So let me start by introducing your moderator. So Asunta Tutino will be moderating the panel today. Asunta is an Associate Director of Business Development here at CSI and works in corporate relations with several of our key corporate clients. She has occupied several roles in the financial services industry, and in particular, she has been a branch manager. So Asunta would be the first to tell you that reaching branch manager status is an important milestone combining presentation skills, relationship skills, business acumen, HR management, marketing, and communications. It requires deft management of employees, customers, and suppliers, and she's welcomed many employees into roles into the financial services sector. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this um, panel over to Asinta, and she will introduce the panelists. Thank you, Marie, and thank you everyone for attending. I also would like to introduce Ryan Laverty, who's Professor of School of Accounting at Financial Services at Seneca College, and Rija Chaudhry, Manager of Early Talent Program at the Royal Bank of Canada. Thank you very much for joining our panelists today. So today's agenda is cut up in four, four subsections. First, we'll start with understanding the roles and career pathways in banking. Then we'll move over to creating a robust professional foundation. And then we'll have meeting the requirements of financial institutions. And then the last part will be the Q&A. So have those questions ready for us. Next slide. So you're going to probably asking here, but what, what we would like to accomplish in this webinar is that you become familiar with the word of world of banking, and what opportunities await you. This is our goal today. Next slide. Getting started. So here we have the Canadian Securities course. Licensing is key, but it's not the only thing that's required in today's market when working for financial service industries. We have to look at communication skills, networking, and customer-facing customer job experience. When you're looking at communication skills, you're probably saying, well, what does that mean? So that means how do we communicate with customers? The listening skills that are required. Networking, you're looking at your LinkedIn profile. What support do you have around you? And then you have those customer facing job experiences. So just think of what you're doing right now as a job experience. You're working at a Tim Hortons, a McDonald's or customer facing. So you know that those jobs are keys when you're dealing with customer service. And they're not quite easy sometimes, but the, the experience you gain is what the financial institutions look like. So in Canadian securities courses, license the key, it's your ticket to get in, but those soft skills is what seals the deal. Next slide, please. Now you're probably wondering, how do I get started in this? It's, financial services is a little complex. There's a lot of departments, there's many lines of businesses. What we're used to is the the retail branch here, which is the first section of the environment. 
Those are when you walk into a branch, you'll probably see the financial service representatives, financial advisors, bank, bank managers. But you're saying, what, so what skills are required for these roles? So this is where the, our career map. I welcome every one of you to visit this. The, the site is on our website, and this is take some time to really focus on this career map and see what different departments, different lines of business has to offer. Next. Once you land into the career map, you'll see what it's going to ask you a few questions. Would you like a customer facing role? Would you like to have a back office role? What skills are required? What do you need to know? What's, what courses are required? So this is where the career map comes in and it shows you all these different departments and different lines of businesses. So here, for example, if I hear the institutional corporate sector, what does that offer? What does that give you? What, what do I have the skill set for this? Is it something that interests me? So there's a little synopsis of what, what the department, the line of business does. And then when you scroll down on the career map, there's also the courses that are needed and what jobs are available. And you say, well, that's interesting, but how about the retail department? Again, then when you, you click on the little icon over here, then I'll tell you what the retail bank does. It gives you a complete view of what the retail banking does, what courses are required, what skill set is required, and it also helps you also with what kind of salary is expected you can have on these, uh, on these skill sets that you bring forward. Next slide, please. Then if you're looking here at the middle office, this is something that sometimes we're not familiar with, but it's also an important role for financial service industry. This is where the compliance comes. So if you're a person who likes compliance, likes IT, likes marketing, this is probably a department that you know would be well suited for you. Again, when you click on the icon, it will tell you what courses are available, what experiences is required, and what attributes you can bring to that. So this is for the middle office. Then if you're looking at the back office, you can also say, well, I'm not sure about the middle office. I'd like to see what the back office does. This is the department when you walk into a branch and you have those, you deposit a check, where does those clearing items go? They help, you know, this is where this department takes care of all that transactional stuff that we see that every day during the banking. So my, my recommendation for you right now is that you spend 80% of your time knowing what field you want to go into, what line of business you want to go. Get familiar with the banking industry. And the, the way to do it is to visit our career map. Get familiar with every single department of the line of business, what experience you can bring, what interests you, and what courses are required. So when you're looking at all our available lines of businesses, this is where, where the fit is. So this is where the, most of the time should be spent. Next slide, please. Getting back to the financial service industry. This is the big bubble we're talking about. We broke it down before in four lines of businesses, but the financial service industry offers all these departments. The purple area here is the retail bank, which is the most popular area and where people start most of their careers. And that, as you can see, it's not linear. You can go from retail, to advice, to mutual fund dealer, but all these departments lead to a career that interests and brings you somewhere where you want to be at the end. So financial service careers go into back office, institutional, middle office, but it's a big bubble here with all those opportunities that you have that can land in your dream job. But the most important thing, and I can't stress enough, is spending most of the time of finding out where is the best fit for you, what courses are required, what skills can I have? What's, what transferable skills can I bring forward? And this is where is the best way to start in your career. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna pivot over to Ryan. Ryan, can you tell us how can graduates pursue and make the most of their opportunities in the dynamic banking industry? Ryan? Thanks, Asimta. So I'd like to thank uh, the CSI first for inviting me to this webinar. I'd also like to thank all of you viewers for tuning in, uh, or if you're watching this on a recording, I appreciate it as well. Uh, I'd like to share some stories from my career journey in financial services. 
uh, in hopes that some of the learnings I've had along the way will help you as you start or you progress in your financial services related career. So I've been everything from a French fry chef to a branch manager at a bank, a financial planner to a director at a financial planning certification body, a self-employed business owner to a college department chair. Currently, I oversee and teach in Seneca Polytechnic's financial services programs, where close to 400 students per year learn the knowledge and skills required to be successful in the financial services industry. My first job, though, was at age 12. I was a soccer referee. I officiated games involving little kids, and as I got older, I moved into officiating games with teenagers and adults. Refereeing taught me that the, or excuse me, refereeing taught me the importance of not only having the technical or hard skills in the field that you're working, but just as important, having those soft skills that Asinta had referred to when she was speaking. Kids and teenagers are emotional. If you ask any parent, uh, you'll find that dealing with them can be difficult. Why? They make decisions based predominantly on emotion. The same is true, though, of grown adults when dealing with their money and finances in many cases. As a referee, I learned how to manage people's reactions, de-escalate emotionally charged situations, and build the interpersonal and communication skills that I often used in the financial services field later in my career. All this to tell you that you don't need to wait until you're in the financial services to build the soft skills that you'll need to be successful. Every experience you have, whether it's a paid job, a volunteer position, or even a school project, it gives you the opportunity to build transferable skills or those soft skills that you'll use in your career. The key is to include these skills on your resume and highlight them when interviewing for a job. My second job was working as a French fry chef at a movie theater. I love movies, and so I applied for a job at the movie theater, mostly because I wanted to watch movies for free on my days off. Ironically, though, I saved more money not paying for movies than I made from working, so I definitely came out ahead financially. But more important, that part-time job slinging fries led to my first full-time job. One night, I was serving fries to a mother and her young daughter. While I was preparing their order, I talked with them about the movie they were going to see, what their favorite movies were, what plans they had for their summer, things like that. I did my best to ensure that their wait time for their food was enjoyable, and it didn't seem quite so long. I would end up doing these same type of things uh, when there was a long line in the bank branches that I managed. This actually helped the teams that I managed win the top customer service award for the entire country. But back to my French fry days, I found out that the daughter loved fries, and it was her favorite part of going to the movies with her mom. I asked her if she had ever had a French fry volcano. She said she hadn't, and so I proceeded to create one by adding even more fries to her tray while making explosive volcano sounds and adding cheese and gravy into the top of it until it overflowed. This delighted her, and she walked away exclaiming to her mother how cool her fry volcano was. While my actions were a little thing that I could do to make the daughter's experience memorable, it had a profound impact on my career. Her mother returned after the movie and offered me a job working as a customer service representative at a welding company that she helped manage. I went from working part-time at minimum wage to working full-time and more than doubling my earnings. The mother shared with me that my ability to build relationships with customers and focus on delighting those customers were two of her company's values, and that what I had done for her daughter demonstrated to her the attitude that would do well in her organization. That job on the customer service desk ended up helping me land my first job in financial services. With relationship building skills and customer experience or customer service experience that included learning new products and being able to recommend potential solutions to customers, I was able to secure a role as a financial services representative at a bank. It wasn't easy to get that role though. I had graduated with a commerce degree and had been calling and visiting bank branches to find a job. This was of course before the internet really came into play and you could apply online. I finally found a branch that said they were hiring bank tellers and to come in for an interview. I didn't get the job, but I soon learned how important getting licensed or certified is. I was disappointed 
uh, to not get the job that I had interviewed for. Since I was just trying to get my foot in the door and start my full-time career after graduating. I decided instead to go back to school to pursue my financial planning designations and complete the Canadian Securities course. While waiting to get my acceptance for college, I met with the bank's human resources team. They had called me up and asked me to come in for another interview. They offered me a full-time role as a financial service representative and said that the branch manager who I met with previously had actually recommended me for a higher role based on my interpersonal and communication skills. There was only one problem. The day they offered me that position was the day I had to submit my intent to attend school full time. I had to make a choice. So I did some thinking and I asked the human resources manager at the bank if she could make the role part time for me instead of full time. I knew there was a risk in doing this, but I thought I, if she could make it part time so that I could pursue my designations, it might work out. She was able to do that and said that the fact that I was pursuing my certifications, particularly my CFC, made me an even more attractive hire since my plan showed her that I was serious about making this a career and not just a job. Looking back on this early part of my career, I can see how important those interpersonal skills and getting certified were to getting my start in the financial services industry. As I worked at the bank, I worked my way up from financial services representative to financial advisor, then to assistant branch manager, and finally branch manager. I attribute my success in moving up in the bank to three things. First of all, engaging in continuing education. Second, having an entrepreneurial approach to business. And third, networking and um, maintaining positive relationships. And so if we can move on to the next slide, that would be great. When working at the bank, I was always interested in learning more, whether it be taking internal courses that the bank offered to help me build my skills, shadowing others to learn how they achieved success themselves, learning about new products, services, and processes, or taking additional external courses to pursue certifications like the CSI's PFP, CIM, CIWM, and FCI, FCSI excuse me, designations. These all helped propel me to the top of the resume pile when I applied for promotions. Uh, while working at the bank, I would always look for opportunities to help clients. And I had a manager who always told me that you are the CEO of the business that happens inside the four walls of your office. And if you can move to the next slide, I think there's a great quote that uh, really showcases this. You really need to plan and execute on your own strategy for achieving success. This is true whether you're applying for a job or whether you're in a job and trying to be successful. And so while I was at the bank, I would plan out my approach, breaking down how many clients I would need to see or call per day. I would track my progress. I'd make adjustments when needed. And this entrepreneurial approach really served me well as an advisor in the branch. Then when I managed the branch, it also helped me because I was now doing it for my entire team. And then when I became a financial planner and was looking for my own clients, I also uh, came back to this entrepreneurial approach or these business acumen skills. Regardless of the position though, I always had a goal to meet. And so the business acumen skills that I developed around entrepreneurship really helped me achieve success. Many people view the entrepreneurial approach as one that's solely sales focused. And so they often focus on only uh, whether helping a client will result in a sale that day or not. This isn't the case though. The entrepreneurial approach is about building relationships and identifying opportunities to help people solve their issues. Sometimes they know what those issues are, they come to you and they ask for help. And often they don't even know that they have these issues often you will find them for them and help them solve. For clients who walked into a branch uh, to get help, whether it be they lost their bank card uh, or whether they needed a printout of a statement, I would help them. Many of my peers saw that as a drain on their time and effort since it wouldn't likely result in a sale that day. But I saw it as an opportunity to build a relationship and look for ways that I could help solve two issues that the client had. One was probably the reason they visited the branch that day. And the second was an issue that they probably didn't even know they had. For example, while setting up their new bank card, 
I would quickly review their bank account usage and their mortgage. If I could find ways to save them money, I would ask if they would be interested in saving money. Because who's ever going to turn down saving money, right? If I offered you that opportunity and said I could save you $100 a month, you'd probably jump at that opportunity. Most times, clients would say, I don't really have time to talk about it today. I just came in to get this piece of my business done. But many were open to meeting with me later to discuss the opportunity. And for those who I couldn't help right at that moment or didn't want to meet, I'd keep in touch with them. I would check in to see how they're doing. And eventually, when they needed help, I was the one that they'd reach out to. Moving on to our next slide, I also uh, looked for opportunities when projects would come up. People said that wasn't part of their job, but I'd jump at that opportunity. If I had never done something before, I'd say, let's do it. Let me try. Let me say yes and figure out how to do it. I met a ton of people across the bank this way. And so when I began for applying, I, excuse me, when I began applying for other jobs in the bank, people already knew me and they were likely to hire me. And for this reason, I can't stress enough the importance of building your network. Again, whether you're in a job or whether you're looking for a job, your network is key to that success. Ask yourself, if you were a hiring manager, who would you rather hire? A person you've met once in an interview who you don't know overly well, or someone whose work you've observed and experienced, or someone who you've had a relationship with, uh, and that professional opportunity to see the type of person they are and how they engage in their work. Networking externally, though, is just as important. Building and cultivating my network over time helped me obtain roles in the financial services education field, which I'm now in. In fact, my network has brought me to you today, as my network includes many members of the CSI team, including those who are on our panel today and on our webinar. They reached out to me to be part of this webinar. And so I'll share this with you, that it's never too early or never too late to start building your network. And so one last thing I'd like you to um, consider, and this is my last slide that I have for you, is that I'd like to leave you with how important it is to find um, an institution or an organization that has a corporate culture uh, that aligns with your own. You're gonna spend a third of your day working. So make sure that you're working somewhere that you enjoy. I left one bank once upon a time to go to another institution. And I quickly found that the corporate culture at the new institution didn't really work well for me. It didn't align with my personal values. And so the work I was doing, while it was uh, fruitful and while it was okay, and I felt I was helping people, uh, there were a lot of things that just didn't gel with my personal values. And so I decided the, to leave that institution. It became that going to work each day became a mundane task rather than an exciting adventure that I was looking forward to. And so one of the things uh, that I started with was around relationship building. I'll come back to to finish up my, uh, my words here. I was really happy that when I left my previous institution, I maintained the relationships I had with people there. I continued to uh, communicate with them. I continued to uh, see them and have lunch with them. Uh, call them up and see how they're doing. And so when I called my previous manager one Friday morning and I said, you know, I'm not happy where I'm at. I'd like to come back and work uh, work with you and work at the branch I was at. He said, no problem. And he had me start the next Monday. He found a position for me because we had a great relationship and he knew my work ethic and the results that I could achieve. So as you can tell from what I've shared with you today about my journey in the financial services field, I'm a big believer in cultivating your soft skills, things like communicating, relationship building, engaging in that continuous learning that you can do both off and on the job, and of course, networking. And so if anyone's looking for help in pursuing their certifications or building the skills required to succeed in the financial services field, please look into the post-secondary education institutions near you. They're there to help get you career ready, both with the hard and the soft skills that you need to succeed. I want to thank CSI and again uh, to you, the viewers, for this opportunity. I'll pass things back to Asinta for the next part of our webinar. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ryan. And, you know, the key takeaways that we have from here, what Ryan's saying, is those communication skills, those networking skills, 
you know, the technical courses, the, the licensing courses. I know a lot of you on the webinars are probably saying, well, how do I get started? How do I get, you know, get those networking skills? How do I meet meet the right people for the job opportunities. So this is where the important parts that we talked about earlier, where the lion's share of the work, 80% of the work has to be doing what position in a financial institution interests me. What position did I do in the past? What transferable skills can I bring forward? Once you have all that information and to our career roadmap and what Ryan's was saying is that you can find the position that most meets your needs. And through that position, then you'll start with the networking. Who can I contact? Where can I get this information? On LinkedIn, who can I reach out to that could mentor me, that could follow me? You know, just ask those questions. How do I get started? This is where it's very important to be prepared. You know, financial institution has a lot of positions available, lots of lines of businesses, and Sometimes when we reach out to the people in the financial institutions, they're probably a little bit busy, but just don't give up. You know, the networking with, within bankers is very huge. There is a lot of help out there and just know where what positions that interest you and how to get there. I want to move over to our next panelist. And this is a great person to ask, is what are financial institutions looking for potential candidates? So Raja, maybe you can help us with that. And what are some of the ways new graduates can hone on their skills in order to fill a job requirement? This is the big questions today, and hopefully you can give us some insight. Raja? Yes, 100% hi, Santa. Thank you so much for uh, passing it over to me. I'm happy to be here today and talk about some, um, you know, things that financial institutions are looking for in potential candidates. Now, I know that, you know, in today's market, everyone is focusing on hard skills, but I think it's becoming apparent that nowadays soft skills are becoming very, very essential when it comes to being effective in your job and just standing out as a candidate or whoever, you know, you're working for, um, <clears throat> regardless of what uh, company you're in. So here's some top soft skills that I think are really, really essential that will make you successful in any role that you're in. Um, and will help you stand out when applying to new roles as well. So the first one I would say is definitely communication skills. Communication skills are so important because regardless of what job you're in, you are going to be communicating day in and day out with so many people, whether it's verbally or in a written way, um, you know, whether, of course, definitely for client interacting roles, client facing roles, and even when it comes to emailing people within the organization, whatever it might be, you're going to be communicating constantly. So with that said, it's definitely so important to make sure you have good communication skills, whether you have to effectively communicate your ideas, whether you have to take complex financial concepts, technical concepts and convey them in a simplified way to customers, clients, team members, whatever it might be. Um, so with that said, personally for me, whenever I'm looking for candidates, um, students who are entering a role, new grads, I definitely look at communication skills just because it makes such a good impact and it's such a good um, skill to have regardless of the role that you're going to be in. The second one is teamwork and collaboration. This is also really important just because nowadays we're living in a world where AI kind of has, you know, automated a lot of those mundane tasks. So nowadays, the roles that we're moving into are more high value roles that have more collaboration, more impact, more innovation required. And with that said, most often people are working in teams, people are collaborating, um, even, you know, it, even if it's cross-functional collaboration, even if it's collaboration with a client that you have, um, it's something that's really important. So with that said, are you someone that people like to work with? Are you someone who can effectively contribute their ideas? Are you someone who is looking to make an impact and can, can contribute to things outside of their own role? So with that said, we really look for candidates that have good teamwork and collaboration, just because majority of the roles nowadays just require teamwork and collaboration. And they're so important to be able to make an impact and, you know, focus on that collective mission to move your team forward and move your company forward. Um, as they say, teamwork makes the dream work. So you want to make sure that you're a good team player and have those skills and exhibit that, um, whether you're, you know, applying for a job or whether you are already hired. The next one is adaptability. So this one is also so important. 
just because, you know, we are living in a landscape that is consistently changing, regardless of what sector you're in, um, even in the financial landscape, you know, even in a bank such as RBC that's so well established and it has structures in place, things can still change and they change all the time. Um, and with that said, when you are in an environment when things are constantly changing, can you keep up? Can you adapt? Um, and that, again, is really important, too, because, you know, you want to make sure that you can handle curveballs that are thrown your way. You want to make sure that you can keep up to date to be able to, um, you know, make changes to the work that you're doing, be able to work effectively um, in different horizons. So with that said, adaptability is just very important too. Even for us on our team, things are constantly moving. And, you know, we love it when our co-ops that are joining us um, for the summer or whatever term they're here for, when they can keep up with the changes and be able to adapt and pivot and, uh, you know, still work efficiently and effectively, regardless of the situation that they're in. So again, super valued skill um, and it goes a long way. The other skill that I want to point to today is analytical and critical thinking skills. I think this is one of my favorite skills. It just points to your problem solving. Are you able to problem solve effectively? Um, regardless of what role you're in, again, um, you know, we love to see when students can take that opportunity or new grads, if they can take the opportunity to come up with a solution, work independently, think outside of the box to come up with a solution that the team will value. Um, with that said, of course, it's, you know, your ability to be creative, your ability to be independent and just think critically um, to come up with solutions that will just benefit the team. Um, so again, when things are changing, you don't want to be there like a sitting duck. You want to be able to move forward, come up with solutions. And again, that is of high value. Um, another skill that I think is really important is emotional intelligence. And that is because there are so many things that can come out of having good emotional intelligence. With this skill, it points to the fact that you can build strong relationships, you can manage interactions, you can navigate difficult conversations, you can manage stress and pressure, resolve conflicts. And these are, you know, situations that you might find yourself in in any job. If you have the emotional intelligence to, you know, navigate your emotions and the emotions of others, it is going to be, you know, the thing that really launches you ahead in your career. Because again, as Ryan mentioned, this is a great skill to have to even build a solid network and your network can open so many doors for you. So um, with that said, it's really important to have that emotional intelligence to be able to tap into understanding how others think, how others feel, and then navigate conversations effectively based on that. The second last one here is leadership potential. This is also one of my favorites. Um, we love it when, you know, people come into our team and are able to take the lead on things. Of course, with that said, uh, regardless of the project, it shows that you have that initiative in you. You are curious, you are excited to take on a project, and you're able to lead it from beginning to end. And it just goes to show that, you know, this person is very responsible, they're motivated to make an impact, they're happy to take an initiative, and just showing that leadership potential makes your team trust you so much more, because they know that you can handle it, and you are excited for taking on new initiatives um, that might even be outside of your scope. So with that said, we love to see leadership uh, potential in candidates. Um, again, they it's definitely a win for us on our team. Last but not least, continuous learning is also very critical. Um, another thing that's great to display when applying for a job or in a job is showing that you have that curiosity and growth mindset to always learn, always grow. Um, and that's because the financial industry, any industry is always evolving. So with that said, we can't stay static. We can't stay the same. We have to keep changing. Um, and with that said, you know, taking that initiative to learn more, being curious, understanding why things happen the way they do. How can we change things to make things better for our team? Um, how can we reach our goals in a better way? That continuous curiosity and that continuous learning um, is a great indication of someone just being a terrific person to work with, terrific person to have on your team, and just showing that willingness to, you know, go take that additional step to make things uh, more effective, more efficient, and more impactful in whatever team you're working in. So I would say that these are just, you know, some of the top skills, top uh, soft skills that employers are looking for. Um, and, you know, hopefully you have an opportunity to build on these skills because they're definitely so critical, regardless of the role that you're in.
And I'm happy to move on to the next slide as well to talk about some great ways that new graduates can hone in on their soft skills to uh, perform effectively in their roles. Perfect. Um, so here are some great ways that you can develop your skills um, and, you know, just really elevate um, these skills that, you know, of course, are very important. So the first one I would recommend is be a part of mentorship programs and networking. This is so, so important, again, because you can learn so much from industry experts and they can really provide you those valuable insights and guidance, especially as you're navigating in the early stages of your career. And with that said, as Ryan mentioned, building that strong professional network can really open doors for you um, and just expose you to so many more job opportunities. So definitely see if there's mentorship uh, opportunities and different programs that you can be a part of um, and, you know, just any networking events that you can attend. And again, this is really going to propel you forward in your career. The next point I would mention is side of desk projects or volunteer work. This again is also really important. And this is more so, you know, if uh, you know you are already in a job and you're looking for additional work outside of your role to pick up a new skill, these are really, really great initiatives. Even volunteer work is great. Uh, for instance, you know, if you're unable to get a job at the moment, but you want to pick up a great skill, volunteer work, you know, to offer your services and work on freelance pro uh, platforms and projects that align with your career goals is really going to benefit you. Because of course, not only does it build your portfolio, it helps you develop new skills and it shows that initiative, um, you know, and that commitment to your chosen field. So, you know, taking that one step further, being a part of different opportunities, volunteer work, side dead projects, um, and, you know, it goes to show that, you know, you're committed to your work, you're committed to learning, and you're building your portfolio and really doing anything you can to develop those skills. My third point here is also take it, you know, take the chance to participate in industry competitions. There's so many competitions that take place, um, you know, whether it's hackathons, whether it's being a part of DECA and being part of those financial competitions, business competitions, things like that. These are such great um, events and initiatives to be a part of, because of course, not only do they provide you that practical experience, but you also get to build your skills and showcase it to potential employers that are attending these events as well. So with that said, participating in these competitions can provide so many benefits. You get to meet so many more people that are in a similar boat as you, and that can, again, really help you get insights to develop on those skills. And again, op you know, open opportunities to even showcase those skills uh, to potential people that you can, you know, that you might want to work with in the future. The second last point is attending workshops and conferences. This, again, is a really good way to, again, develop your skills and just stay up to date with industry trends. As I mentioned, we live in a constantly changing world. So going to these seminars and events and workshops is really going to stay, um, really going to help you stay up to date with industry trends, best practices, emerging technologies. Um, and again, this is really going to help you stay, you know, um, up to date with the field that you're interested in and really help you with, um, you know, having that knowledge that is going to help you stand out because you're constantly up to date. Last but not least, I would also recommend taking online courses and certifications um, relevant to, you know, the field that you would like to pursue. Um, there's so many courses and platforms that you can join uh, for courses on finance, business analytics, coding, other skills that can enhance your marketability. Um, and with that said, you know, it's, it's really important to, again, stay current, show that initiative that you're looking to learn. And, you know, in the process of looking for opportunities, this is really going to help you elevate your skills. And it's a great thing that you can communicate to employers as well in interviews to let them know, you know, I'm really interested in so-and-so um, in this financial concept, whatever else it might be. And, you know, I've taken that initiative to learn it on my own. And here are some courses that I've taken. Here are some certifications or credentials that I have. Um, and, you know, it, again, it just shows that initiative and drive to impact. So with that said, hopefully this was insightful. Um, I guess these would just be my, you know, recommendations for how you can enhance your skills and just some skills that you should really um, highlight when looking for new opportunities or discussing opportunities with hiring managers or employers that you're interested in working with. And at this point, I'd love to pass it back to Santa to carry us forward in the webinar. Thank you, Raja. I just want to take a couple of minutes here, and if I can have Ryan back on the line as well, 
uh, it's, you know, to offer some insightful uh, insights. Uh, you know, we're getting a lot of questions on, you know, the uh, what you've your career roadmap was it was excellent. You know, you started off not in the financial service industry. It wasn't linear. Uh, those past experiences that brought you there, uh, working, you know, like you said, in, in you know, selling French fries, giving that extra French fries, having that networking, but all those skills and all the everyday things that we do does prepare you for customer service roles. Let's prepare you in the world of banking and all those communications and all the stuff that you bring forward. Can you just go and, and help our viewers today, uh, you know, see the benefit of having all the, you know, bringing all the skills that they have with them forward and not being afraid actually, right? So it's, it's, it's very difficult to stand up amongst the peers. But, you know, how do we stand out amongst the peers is the real question here. Yeah, it's a great uh, question, Asanta. I think that, um, you know, when you look at what you are, uh, you're working at or your volunteer work or, or any of those activities that uh, Rija has talked about as well, you know, whatever activity you're in, you know, take a step back and say, you know, if I had to write one sentence about this um, to explain to people, you know, the, the skill set that I've got from it, um, or that I've worked on, or things like that. Um, you know, if you can do that and get one or two uh, sentences about that, um, I think that's really going to be helpful and very clear. It will bolster your resume. Um, and so, you know, we chat a lot about um, uh, preparing our students. And, and when I was in industry, I looked for the same things, uh, is about uh, the skill sets and the results that you have. So if you can combine those into, you know, one or two bullet points uh, on your resume about, you know, here's the volunteer position I had, here's the communication skills that I used and how I effectively, you know, help this um, uh, project progress um, and what the result was. If you can get that into your resume, I think that's going to stand out to a, a hiring manager a lot more than if you had a resume that just listed your responsibilities or duties. Um, because it's going to show to the hiring manager exactly the skills you have and what you could do for them, which is really what they're looking for, right? They want to know what can you do for them when you get to their organization. So I think if you can put those into your resume, that will uh, perhaps help you stand out a little bit better. And once you have those one or two sentences, you know, kind of commit them to memory so that they roll off your tongue very easily. Because when you're in a situation, uh, where you could network, you know, it could be in an elevator and you're chatting with someone, you know, it could be at a sporting event and you meet someone, you want to be able to, you know, talk about those one or two things very quickly um, to spark their interest. And then you never know where that will go. That might lead to a, a, an interview or a, a potential job opportunity or things like that. Asha, I, how do people stand out? So, you know, in their resumes or how, is there any other networking events that financial institutions hold that they can have? You know, sometimes they have career fairs. Uh, sometimes, you know, we go, you know, so is there something that's, you know, what can we offer our students today in, in being more uh, transparent in, in the financial service industry? Yes, 100%. I feel like the RBC is involved in so many different initiatives and there's so many different events that, you know, you can attend, um, especially when you're early on in your career. I would just really recommend looking into um, Googling different seminars that are taking place. I know this might be a bit of a vague answer. It's just that RBC is involved in so many different uh, portfolios that it can be a bit overwhelming to think of one um that would be really helpful but with that said um i actually got um introduced to a lot of people in rbc by going to a diversity event called ascend um, and that's where i got to meet a lot of people from different financial institutions um so again there isn't any one particular event i think that would be really helpful but just taking that chance to google into different events that are happening um and seeing if you can attend network with different financial industry experts and hopefully that helps. Santa, I hope I answered that question correctly. Please let me know if there's a second part that I missed there. <laughs> and that's exactly what, you know, our viewers, you know, they're, they're looking for, right? Is where can I go meet 
you know, the, 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 the higher ups, you know, the hiring managers, you know, uh, you know, LinkedIn is great, but sometimes, you know, to get a response takes a little while or, you know, so this is where, where can we, meet, where can we find these networking events that we can assist, right? I know at the colleges, universities, there's a lot of mingling, Brian, sometimes you invite partners in from uh, financial institutions, you know, if you can elaborate on that as well. I, I think our, our our group today is looking is where can I be seen and where can I go, right, and meet them. Yeah, it's a great point, Asanta. I think that, uh, you know, the post-secondary education um, uh, space, you know, we try as much as possible to connect employers with, uh, with potential hires. Uh, and so uh, all of our students have access to uh, the information sessions that we have with employers or organizations, they have access to the career fairs that uh, we bring um, those parties together. Uh, and then, you know, they get to work on different projects. And many of the projects that are there are working with employers as well. Uh, and so there's lots of uh, lots of opportunity. So I think that there's, um, you know, great potential in the post-secondary education space to to do that. But you know, outside of that, uh, you know, as, as Raja has said, you know, make sure you are looking at the institutions that are uh, of interest to you and go onto their websites and find out. Um, and then, of course, you know, one of the things that we always chat about, it, and this is what I found throughout my own education at different levels, uh, is uh, reach out to, to your peers that you went to school with or uh, do the same for uh members of your community who you engage with in, at different events or, or different places. Um, those are the people who know you best. And those are the people who will uh, talk about you to, uh, you know, for potentially their employer. They might say something along the lines of, you know, I got into this company. I really love working here. I love working with this team. You know, I've got another friend who I think would be really good. And again, it might not lead to anything at the beginning, but it broadens your network. And maybe you have five or 10 minutes with a person at that institution and uh, and you're able to either sell yourself the, the skills you have and the results you can get um, or that person sees something in you that uh, that they may be able to help direct you to the right uh, the right place and so I think that CSI uh, map that you showed earlier you know how complex and how big financial services is you know if you think you're that one person you start in one of those dots and you know, find out about that part of the industry and maybe you know someone in there, um, then chat with them. And that can soon spread very quickly that you are now going to different parts and having different conversations with people. So the, the goal and I think the key, and it can also be the most frightening part of it is, is just chat with people. Get out there and talk and say, you know, I'm looking for this role or I'm interested in this part of the business. And, you know, if they don't know someone, maybe they do know someone uh, that knows someone who could help you out as well. And I'm happy to just add in one more point uh, here as well. If you're uh, looking for different events that you can attend, one thing you can do is um, follow people in the early talent space in different financial institutions. And they are often posting events that they're going to be attending, ways that you can register to attend these different seminars or workshops or conferences. Um, so following industry experts and leaders and people in the early talent space can actually give you insight into what's happening and where you can attend uh, to learn more about these different spaces. So um, yeah, I, I would definitely say that. And again, echoing to Ryan's point, I think just connecting and reaching out to as many people as you can has been really effective for me. Um, someone usually ends up responding back and it leads to a connect that's really helpful. So that's what I would just contribute. If I can just add one more point uh, to that as well, Asanta, the, um, you know, what we see a lot of times, uh, we hold some career fairs at, at our college, uh, and I see people lined up to go to the banks. Um, at, they're the most well-known. They probably have the most jobs available. Um, and not to say the banks aren't great. I worked to a bank. I loved it. Um, you know, I love being a part of that. Uh, but as you can see, my career came through a different avenue to get into the bank. So sometimes it's about taking a step back and saying, you know, let's play as well the odds game. You know, I'm sure Rija can talk about, you know, the odds of getting a role at RBC, you know, the number of people that are probably applying for every role. You know, if you find a smaller organization to start with, 
And it may not even be in financial services, but it helps you build those skill sets that we've chatted about. You know, that's an opportunity that you may be able to get a role and spend a year or two there, build up those skills, build up your network, and then move into the financial services field. So don't be afraid to, you know, widen the net that you don't just apply to the big banks that we all know. Um, while they're great and they provide great training and they uh, will result in great careers, it might not be that you start in the bank. It might be that you start elsewhere and move into that uh, that space. And you're exactly right, right, right? It's like we said earlier, a career in banking is never linear. You don't always start at one area. You know, it's what, what roles that we do, what positions that we did in the past that sets us up, what networking, what people that we meet. I think that's where uh, we can't stress enough of the 80% rule is preparation. So where do I see myself? How do I get that position? What skills do I need to get there? Right. So, and that's where, you know, you have to work on. Uh, we're looking at a lot of careers in banking and, you know, so we had some questions and maybe Raja and Ryan, you know, being an alumni of CSI. They're asking about the wealth management space and, you know, the PFPs and how do I get there? So, uh, you know, we can share some screens on our career roadmap. Uh, if you look at under detail banking or wealth management, you scroll down, the list of courses are there. So maybe, Brian, you can talk to us about your journey to your PFP or your CIWM or your CIM designation. And, and of course, our prestigious designation of the FCSI that you have as well. Uh, just how did that lead to, right? And how did that come about? Yeah, I was in the uh, working in the, the bank in, in my early roles. And, and as I said, I was always curious and uh, involved in continuing education. I wanted to learn more and, and see how I could build my career. Um, and, and I went to the CSI website and, and said, you know, where do I want to be? And I think exactly what you said, Asenta, you know, kind of work backwards. I said, you know, I wanted to be in financial planning at some point. Um, and in many cases, and I find this for many institutions, you know, you won't move straight into the financial planning or wealth field. You know, you'll start and build up your career um, uh, before you get into that space. And so I looked, you know, what were the the designations or the pathways that would help me get there? They would, uh, you know, perhaps put me on the top of someone's list. Um, and so the certifications was one piece of that. Uh, and so I started to build on those and uh, I took my uh, uh, IMT and PMT courses uh, in order to get my CIM designation. And then from there, you know, I thought, okay, I've got my CIM designation and, you know, what else can I do, um, while I'm still working in the bank and, and moving up. Um, and, you know, I went then to get my CIWM designation, uh, and then I continued on with, uh, my FCSI designation and it becomes, you know, a bit habit forming because you, you say, yeah, uh, I've enjoyed doing these courses. I've learned. I'm using the material in my my role. Um, I'm building skill sets here. Um, all the while, if I'm chatting with others about the fact that I'm I'm taking these courses and that I'm interested in a financial planning job, uh, sometimes then it, it just takes time when those uh, um, when those opportunities become available. Then you know you've got everything you need that you look like the best uh, potential candidate that you can be in front of that hiring manager. Um, the other great thing is, you know, once you get into some of these roles or some of these designations, um, you have to continue with continuing education as part of being a professional. Uh, and so the CSI, that's one of the great things about them is they have so many um, different courses and different avenues that you can explore um, that you might even find some some designations or some certifications and spaces that you didn't even think you would be interested in. Um, and again, that opens up areas for you to uh to to learn about and then perhaps even excel in if those are places that you would like to be at. thank you ryan and that ties in with raja what she was saying earlier about that continuous learning right so you know if anybody has worked in financial institution it's always that continuous learning so i'm going to leave with this one last question it's great when we're in we got fired so we have all these you know positions that we can go in so we have one question for you, Raja, is can you share any insights on how new graduates can best position themselves for success in an entry-level role 
considering their limited professional experience now. Yes, 100%. And I think the advice we most often give to our new grads is network, network, network. Um, most often, everyone wants to work with someone they like. That's just the fact of the matter. And I think that building that network is just so critical, especially when you have your foot in the door, take advantage of it. When you're not in the organization, it's hard to know what is the best way to reach this person? How can I you know, make an impact? How can I get connected? Things like that. But when you're already in the company, it just becomes so much more easier to get connected and people are so much more open to networking with you and sharing their insights and things like that. Um, so what I would really recommend is, um, you know, network and also find a mentor. Um, find someone who's going to sponsor you, champion you in the organization, give you exposure to new skills. Um, I got really lucky in that, uh, in the fact that, you know, I had great management that really put me forward for new opportunities. They gave me exposure to side of desk opportunities as well, where I could kind of make an impact, get more exposure to other teams. So if you are new to an organization, you are early, you know, uh, early on in your career and you're looking to make an impact and explore new roles, I would say just network with as many people as you can and really take that step in showing initiative. You know, do things that are perhaps outside of your scope show that you're willing to learn new skills. Um, I've seen this a lot with our new grads as well. When they join, they want to be involved in other projects. They want to help out other teams and they want to make an impact to the overall collective organization, which is so great to see. So you're not siloed in your own role, keeping your head down in just one thing, but you're actually putting yourself out there um, and you know being involved in different initiatives. Um, so with that said, Long story short, I would just really recommend you to take that initiative to explore new opportunities, side of desk projects, help out other people within your team, show that initiative, and just really network with people and, you know, start thinking about what are you interested in next? Um, it's best to think two roles ahead sometimes, um, and that's really going to help you navigate to the next move. Um, so that's just, that's just what I would say for that question. Thank you. So just to wrap things up, uh, we're going to just take there's some key takeaways over here. And 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 Ryan, I do appreciate when you said, you know, sometimes, you know, our paths are not linear and we want that, you know, big financial institution to work for one of the big six right away. Sometimes working at a smaller firm is is, is okay, right? It's, you get that experience, you get that, you know, get that networking, you meet people. So that's fine as well, right? It doesn't matter what experience, where you work, where, you know, what position it is. It's gain all those experiences that they can take with you. And yet sometimes it will take time. Like it's not, it's, you know, patience is very key, but uh, eventually, you know, with everything we learned today and hopefully you took some great things away that uh, your positions are just uh, waiting for you. Thank you very much, Marie. Great. Well, that really concludes our event for today. I'd really like to thank uh, Rija and Ryan for giving us such great insights. It's really a around getting yourself out there. And um, as a as an introvert, I would say you really have to break out of your shell. Um, just put your hand out, go to your branch manager, walk into your bank and talk, talk to people in the bank. Don't just do card banking, uh, you know, get get yourself known. Um, really thank you for your, for your insights. And Asunta, thank you very much for moderating. So if you do have additional questions, please go to our website and look for our support button. If you press the support button, you'll get lots of answers to lots of questions. You can find the career map also on our website. Um, but if you don't get the answer you're looking for, please post a, a, a ticket and we will get your answer back to you as soon as possible. A replay of this event will be available in the coming days, so look out for that um, if you weren't able to attend or you missed part of it or you want to pass it on to uh, someone who didn't get a chance to attend. Finally, thank you for attending. Have a great day and good luck on your path to a career in financial services. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.